Welcome back to the podcast, everybody. This is for us, Siddiqui. This is the Upper Hand Fantasy Show. I'm here with Zach Rizzuto. We're back. Review, we're reviewing Sunday's games, week 11. We're getting closer and closer to the fantasy playoffs. Every single play is just so, so important. Every fantasy point, you know, we're counting them all. We're counting them all, and uh, we need it all, okay? Trade deadline is, is basically going on right now. You know, people are scrambling to make moves. You know, collusion going on in my home league. I don't know what's happening. We have to reverse a trade just now for Christian McCaffrey. Ain't happening. Uh, you know, when Faraz is the commissioner, listen, I, I'm going to, I'm I, I got to, I got to make sure things, you know, I got to put my foot down sometimes. You know what I'm saying? And I know, Richard, you're listening to this because you listen to the show. Uh, you're not going to pull any fast ones on me. Okay, just letting you out. Letting as you, know you right see. Now. <laughs> As you see the notification come up, we they, there's a new trade completed in that league. <laughs> it just came up. Oh really? Right okay. Now, so uh, okay. Let's check it. Let's check it. Let's check it. Let's check it. Right? Yeah. So, um, so somebody said has better. Been I guess it's, it's definitely not uh, better. Very, is it a similar it's trade? Uh, okay. Oh okay. okay. I, I'm okay with that. Dobbs, okay. Judy, and Etn. Etn for McCaffrey. Not that bad. For McCaffrey. Uh, huh. Dobbs. This is a super flex league. So this mm-hmm. is better, for sure. Uh, Dobbs did go into the injury tent. Is he okay? Yeah, he's like back. That? He's, he's back, back in the game? game? Okay. Right. All right. We are Gucci. That's what I'm putting into the chat. Great. Cool. That's how it happens. But I am upset that he has McCaffrey because he has a good team already. And, but you did beat him. <laughs> so there you go. There you I go. did. I did, but that was just because I had tanked out. This is how you do it, guys. A trade, a trade came. A trade, you know, went through in our league. We have no vetoes. I don't have any vetoes in any league. If there is vetoes in the league where like like league mates can vote on a veto and then like not let a trade go through, like I will not join that league because I just don't like how. I, I, most trades get vetoed because people are jealous that they didn't make a better trade or they don't that right. they're jealous that they're not part of that trade. So to avoid that. I just let all trades go through, but at commissioner's discretion, right? If there's collusion, they're subject to review. Exactly, you <laughs> have to reverse it. You have to be able to reverse it, um, and that's that's kind of where we're at. And now we reversed it, and then the trade just went through again, but with a much much better, uh, you know, a, a much better outcome here, where they actually had to give yeah. up some legit assets. So. I'm, it, Sorry, like, I, I like, just slipped. I didn't finish your sentence for you. By the way, <laughs> like I usually by do. the way, what would you know? I'm not saying that like I would have made this deal, but it, it doesn't really matter, right? As, as long as it's not right. collusion and there's like one side is like ridiculously lopsided over the other. Okay. Anyway, moving on. I'm sure you guys care so much about my home league. Uh, anyway, the philosophy. <laughs> it's a philosophy thing. It is as a commissioner. You I know, think you, so. you have to preach a little bit sometimes. Sometimes you do. You know, you, you can impart that knowledge. <laughs> one thousand percent. Hundred percent. All right. So, um, so yeah, getting back to you know your leagues, guys. Uh, we, we're going to review what happened today. Uh, we, we have so much to talk about. A few injuries to to hit on. What to expect moving forward for a lot of these guys. And, and I think we could just go ahead and get started. Um, let's start with Jalen Warren. This was in one of the early games. He had another big game despite Najee Harris out snapping him uh, in this one, but. You know, Warren, you know, obviously has made his case as to why he's the best running back in Pittsburgh. And he's made his case for a little while now. But he's gone over 100 yards from scrimmage in three straight games. He's averaging 14.3 touches over this three-game stretch. So, like, not enough for him to, like, sustain that production. But but here's the thing, right? He gets Cincinnati next week. Good matchup. He gets Arizona the week after. You know, New England, okay. But Indy, Cincinnati, Seattle, like, the schedule for running backs – Pretty good overall, right? Now, they, this team cannot depend on the pass game right now, right? So he's proving, and like if they do depend on the pass game, it's like to the running backs. They're just throwing it to the flat on in, on every play, right? Yeah. So, you know, he's proving that he's playable as maybe you know more maybe more than a flex play moving forward because they're using him just enough, and he's like being extremely efficient with the touches that he's getting. Yeah, extremely efficient is an understatement. <laughs> I think at this point, you know, he's like the engine of the Steelers' offense. Even if Matt Canada and everybody else doesn't want to acknowledge it, you know, it's like a, it's whole... like a, it's like a, the engine of like a locomotive. You know what I'm saying? Does that yeah. make sense? Like it's like the engine is I, like I think... really strong, but then like the rest of it, the car, 
or the, the rest of the vehicle is, is like absolutely terrible. Heavy as shit <laughs> and just a complete load right. to be carried. Exactly. Like that's what I think that's a perfect analogy actually when you when you bring that up. That's actually hundred percent true. You know, like maybe Matt Canada doesn't realize that he's the engine. I can't really put it past him at this point because the offense has just been abysmal. But Wern is the bright spot. You know, like you mentioned, he looks like a really strong flex play. You might even be able to get away with him as your RB two in certain weeks. This was a tough matchup against the Browns. And he delivered. You know, the limited workload, it hasn't really kept him from turning in passable weekly performances the whole season. You know, this what this workload that he got, like nine carries and a couple uh, passes in the passing game, that's nothing new. It hasn't kept him from being serviceable. You know, it was no different today. It doesn't look like he's going to get that clear starter workload. You know, even though he was named starter or whatever, they had that whole thing happen ahead of the game last week in week 10. But at this point, I think we just need to look at the production that he's had. And it's not like Najee's running away with the work in the backfield either. So Warren, as long as he keeps getting his work, you know, we can't expect this type of ceiling every week, but the floor has been perfectly fine. Now, granted, six, seven, eight points. He had a couple of those at the beginning of the season, but these past four or five weeks, he's been getting on top of it. And like you mentioned, the passing game is running through the running backs now at this point because Kenny Pickett, he's like regressed and is affecting everybody in the offense. Um, but yeah, no, 100%, man. Like, here's the thing for me, it's like, have you ever like driven like those old muscle cars? Those old muscle cars have like these really strong engines. And then like, but if yeah. you want to turn, if you want to make it like a turn, like it takes, it's such a wide angle and you have to like turn the steering wheel like crazy and like <laughs> yeah, get this crazy saying. angle to make no it power turn. Steering. It, yeah, no power yep. steering. There you go. And, you know, that's, that's <laughs> what it feels like. So I'm going to continue with that analogy, even though it was over five minutes ago. Um, so, you know, just along with that comes the extremely disappointing games from Deontay Johnson. Right after very solid three game stretch after he came back from IR, Pickett has just been absolutely brutal. Right, it, it, un, you know, unfortunately, Deontay he has to overcome this offense, right? And it's going to be really, really tough at times. This is one of those tough times, right? But I, I'm yeah. not panicking, okay? Like, it was obviously a tough matchup for Deontay against the Browns. Like, I personally thought that he would be able to overcome it potentially. Like, maybe, you know, I was a little bit too optimistic with Deontay Johnson this week, but I think moving forward, he should be fine. Like, don't look at this matchup and be like, all right, man, I just got to bench Deontay moving forward. I don't think this is that type of situation. Um, I think he's going to get the ball, like, you know, moving forward. Um, but this is just uh, this was just a rough one overall. Yeah, not a lot of receivers are going to be capable of overcoming the type of performance that Kenny Pickett had today. <laughs> like, it was bad. Like, there's Kenny Pickett playing normally, but there was no fourth quarter resurgence like we saw these past couple weeks. Everyone was like, oh, Kenny Pickett's a fourth quarter court quarterback. You know, he comes in the first three quarters, he's terrible. The fourth quarter, he turns things on. You know, that was making Deontay Johnson relevant, that kind of thing. None of that today. Remember on Friday how we were talking about all these really talented wide receivers being forced to play with backup quarterbacks, and we were, they were just watching their fantasy ceilings go down the toilet? That's what's happening with Deontay Johnson, but this quarterback just happens to be the starter. That's Kenny Pickett. It's just, like, terrible. As has usually been the case, though, with Deontay Johnson, I think this might be the silver lining here, is his target share. 28%. He had eight targets on the afternoon. He led the team once again. It's not a new story. We've seen this 100 times. He's a volume-based play, and this is the type of game you get sometimes with volume guys, you know? Sometimes the volume is there, and then you're able to catch six or seven passes, and they'll have 80 yards, and they'll be fine. Sometimes you get games like this where he catches two, and it's just a really quiet performance overall. This is what happens. We knew that this was going to be the case in some games this season, the way Kenny Pickett was playing. I'm not panic panicked because we figured the ceiling was going to be low or lower, but I'm definitely keeping an eye on his production in these next few weeks because three points isn't going to cut it as a floor for a wide receiver who we were ranking as a wide receiver three. So unless Kenny Pickett can turn things around, I'm going to give them the benefit of the doubt because Deontay Johnson does get those targets, and this was a really inefficient day for Deontay Johnson on the workload that he got. But I'm going to keep an eye on it and make sure that things do rebound. If they don't next week, we might have to start talking about downgrading Deontay Johnson the rest of the way. Yeah, no, I, I, I totally hear that, man. Um, and on the other side of the ball, you know, Jerome Ford's role took a little bit of a step back, but also took a step forward at the same time. Like, you know, he was the clear goal line back in this game, like a role that I was looking for him to get that he didn't have before this game, right? He, and he ended up scoring. But Kareem Hunt also closed the gap otherwise. Ford only played four more snaps than Hunt in this game. It was really more of a 50-50 split in this one outside of the goal line role uh, and outside of passing downs. Uh, but Hunt took some of the two-minute work away 
Uh, now, you know, you can still start Ford as like a low end RB2 if he continues to have that goal line role. But, you know, I was kind of hoping that, you know, he would get that goal line role, but then also maintain like a, a really like a far majority of all the other work as well. Yeah, he hasn't been able to complete that trifecta, you know, where you have the two minute work early down and then a goal line roll. Like if we could just get that for Jerome Ford, that would be great. And we were calling for it last week. We we're like, man, if only Jerome Ford could get that goal line touchdown. That would put him over the top and he would be that type of uh, he'd be a potentially low RB1 the rest of the way. Yeah. So he gets that this week, but now he's missing the two-minute roll. It's like, come on. Like, we can't get it all in one. You take one away, but you add another. It's always just going to be one of those situations where one part of the puzzle is missing, and it's going to keep him having the ceiling. He had the exact same fantasy point output as last week, this week. So that's also just, like, weird coincidence, but it's really just indicative of the type of season that he's having. The workload just hasn't been put together for him to have that ceiling that we want him to. Kareem Hunt pulls even in overall touches. You know, that just feels like a typical Jerome Ford game now, it feels like. You know, it doesn't look like Hunt's going anywhere in the offense as long as he's healthy. That's going to limit Ford the rest of the way. He's a low-end RB2, like you mentioned. And upside's going to be limited by the Browns' offense just not operating all that smoothly. You know, they won the game today, sure. But DTR still didn't do anything to reassure me that Cleveland's offense is going to be good enough to give Ford any kind of ceiling over what he's getting right now. You know, we thought, we, we've thought seen a talent with Ford. We know that he's talented. But the way that the offense has been running doesn't tell me that he's going to be able to have a high touchdown ceiling. He's not going to be able to depend on touchdowns. There could be games where he has a low floor as well. And for that reason, I'm out on him. as <laughs> really potential RB1 that we were talking about him being if he could get that work. It looks like the stars just aren't going to align at this point. Yeah, you know, like 12 carries for each of these guys. Like I was hoping that, you know, the share could be something like if they're going to get 24 carries between them while well, Pierre Strong also had a carry so 25 running back carries all together in this game like I would hope that like you know Ford can get like 18 of those carries you know what I'm saying and like with yeah. the two minute work potentially with the goal line and then he gets a couple catches and then the goal line roll like that, that's amazing but you know is it too much to ask like, too I, much I, I don't think I it don't is. think it is man <laughs> like stop giving Kareem Hunt touches uh, but by the way, David Njoku had 15 targets in this game from Dorian Thompson Robinson. That's a 35% target share. Good for Njoku moving forward. Uh, Amari Cooper had only one more target than Elijah Moore. 19% and 18% target share for those two, respectively. Not going to get it done. Okay, he, he, I think Amari Cooper is going to have to be very much more involved moving forward if we're going to depend on him for fantasy. Okay, um, it, it's yeah. it's not not good. it's not great now. We've had a few injuries to running backs this week. Aaron Jones suffered a knee injury. It looked pretty bad as if he was, as you know as he was getting carted off. But he talked to a reporter in the locker room. He said that he caught a break, like he thought it was a potential ACL because he was in so much pain. But it might not be. Uh, MCL sprain is a possibility here. He could miss some games. Uh, Matt Lafleur said he doesn't think it's a long term injury. Uh, so you know, in the meantime, AJ Dillon will carry most of the load. He gets Detroit. Kansas City the next two weeks, not ideal, to be honest. Um, Low-end RB2, like, at best. You know, probably not even that. He's most likely going to be outside my top 24. He's got this opportunity before this year. He has not come through. And then on top of that, he has, like, tough matchups, especially next week. So, yeah. not, like, not excited, not super excited if I had AJ Dillon or anything like that over the next two. Yeah, no one's, like, jumping for joy, like, yes, we have a handcuff. He's going to be this producer for us. The rest of the way, it's like, no, that's not the case. I'm definitely not starting Dylan as a low RB2 these next few weeks. Like like you mentioned, that's probably the tip top of his ceiling that we've based on what we've seen so far. You know, at least if I have to start him, I'm not expecting that kind of production. So don't go and plug A.J. Dillon in your lineup and think, all right, I got myself a solid RB2 or even a low RB2. Don't kid yourself. We know what we have with A.J. Dillon. You know, there, you mentioned those matchups. Those are two very high-quality defenses. Dylan's coming off a yet another fresh two-yard per carry performance against the Chargers and relief of Jones. I do think Jones is going to miss some time, you know. Um, I'm not a doctor, by the way, but uh, not a long-term injury. Not a long-term injury, like um, LaFleur said, um, would imply that – sorry, I, I'm getting mixed up here. Cut this out. Not a long-term injury would imply, like you said, that he might not have – one of those major injuries like an ACL, but an MCL injury is still going to be a couple weeks at least, I feel yeah. like. So that's not ideal for teams looking to make a playoff push if they're counting on Jones to be there for that. I don't want to rely on him and think, okay, maybe he'll be back in a week or two. You don't want to get hung up on that. A.J. Dillon, at the same time, isn't somebody that you're just going to be able to put into your lineup 
and expect him to produce, you know, these next two weeks, especially if you're trying to make a playoff push. He is a last resort if you have nobody else to put in. Yeah, Kenneth Walker also got hurt early in this game with an oblique injury, potentially a similar injury that Christian McCaffrey had about a month ago when we thought he'd miss, but he actually didn't miss any games. Um, but, you know, Kenneth Walker's had a little bit of a history with core injuries. It's possible he misses time. Pete Carroll, well, they also play on Thursday night, right, on Thanksgiving. Uh, but Pete, Car Pete Carroll called it a legit core injury. Not sure what that means, but if he does miss time, Zach Charbonnet obviously gets a big increase in work. He, he was already the passing down back. He was already working in on early downs a bit, so I can see him being an RB2 next week. Seahawks play the 49ers on Thanksgiving. Not the best matchup. The Cowboys the following Thursday night. Not the best matchup, but is doable. And then the 49ers once again. Uh, I still think Charbonnet will be startable because of the fact that he'll likely play a big role in all situations, right? He ended up seeing 94% of the team's remaining running back carries in this game, 86% of the team's remaining running back receptions. He's the guy, okay? 21 touches in this game. Even in tough matchups, he's a good start because of that role in the receiving game, and that's a role that Kenneth Walker didn't have. So Charbonnet, because of all that, Charbonnet is going to be safe in any type of game script, if that makes sense. Yeah. That's 100% the way I'm viewing it. You know, that receiving role is what's been keeping him afloat in fantasy while Walker's been in. You know, that's what's made him relevant besides, you know, just being a handcuff at this point because he had a little bit of receiving upside. But now you add that rushing work on top, if Kenneth Walker would miss, that can make things really interesting. You know, I don't want to get ahead of myself here calling him a solid RB2 in that scenario where Kenneth Walker's out and he's going to get the workload. You know, the Seahawks offense hasn't looked fantastic these past few weeks, but he'd definitely be an intriguing start for me if I had him. Like, given the choice between him and a guy like Alexander Madison, you know, would I rather start Charbonnet? I, I think absolutely. In theory, we could call him an RB2, so we lump him into that bucket, RB2s. I think if we just went player for player and compare Charbonnet and that potential role you just outlined for next week against other so-called RB2s, you know, guys in that same range, we'd probably lean Charbonnet over a lot of them. Like, what, what do you think? Because the workload, the potential workload here that he's looking at, if Walker would miss some time, could make him a solid RB2 or a high RB2, especially if the Seahawks can be competitive in these games. Now, it's the 49ers, I know, and they've been blowing teams out recently. Again, they're back to their ways, and they have the Cowboys on Thursday night. But I think that that matchup against Dallas isn't that bad because the Panthers were getting it done today against the Cowboys. Their run defense has been suspect this whole season, and they've been able to mask that pretty much by going up pretty early in games. I, I think that the schedule isn't as bad as it looks right now, and Charbonnet's role could make him – you know, one of the sneakier good plays these next couple next couple of weeks if Walker would miss. Yeah. Now, that being said, players usually don't miss that much time with an oblique injury. Okay, so if I had to guess, I would guess that Kenneth Walker misses this week on Thursday night because they only have a couple, couple days before that game, and then he's back for the Cowboys game. That would be my guess based on history of oblique injuries for players in general. Um, most of the time, players miss right. zero games. But usually they have to, they have a whole week, um, just like Christian McCaffrey was able to come back and play. Um, but you know, looking at, at the large date sample size of players who have oblique injuries, um, I looked at a tweet from Dr. Edwin Poras on Twitter. Um, he's been on the show before, and he's kind of outlined that list for us. Okay. Um, all right, moving forward. Devon Achane hurts his knee again in his highly anticipated return. Mike McDaniel said his knee was landed on, and he got positive feedback from the trainers. They didn't let him back in because they wanted to be careful. It was the same knee that he was out with. Okay, so Achane wanted to come back in. He was trying to come back in, but they just didn't let him. Probably a good idea, right? Like for us, not a not a deal, but you know, for the long term right. prospects of Achane, probably a good idea. It seems like there's a chance he can be back next week. It just sucks that he had to leave the game so early. Raheem Mostert ended up taking all the work in this game. Jeff Wilson was active. And, you know, it's possible. I think I think Ahmed is like third string at this point. Yeah, he is. You know, and the one thing that's good for A-Chain's managers is that even though they got stuck, you know, with a 1.5 bomb in their lineups, like he got the ball early and it was clearly a part of what Miami wanted to do. Sometimes there's training wheels involved with players coming back from injury, but he got a look on the ground. And it looked through the air. It looked like he was doing his thing. He was part of what they wanted to do. I'm grasping at straws here for good things a little bit with him because I had him in my lineup and in our league, you know. So you're definitely trying to rationalize and find something good out of what we saw from Devon A. Chain today. But hopefully this isn't something that forces him to miss even more time. 
it is going to be Raheem Moster if De- Devon A. Chain wouldn't be able to go this next week. But I'm to a point, and I think you're probably there too. It's like I'm not going to go into this week assuming he's going to miss based on those reports that we heard after the game. You know, yeah. I'm going to go in and assume that he's probably going to play, but understand that he, there's a chance he might not, especially if they want to take it easy with him. Um, they still have a long season to play. We're over halfway through the season, but there's still plenty of games left, meaningful games that they'll want to have HM for. So they might not rush him back. Yeah, for sure. And, and you know, and the reason why I mentioned um, uh, Salvin Ahmed is because he got three carries in this game and Jeff Wilson was inactive. Okay, Moster got 22 carries in this game. And it's good because he seems healthy enough because, you know, the workload would have been split between him and Ahmed, you know, if Moster wasn't 100%. Because keep in mind that Moster had a bunch of limited practice, practices this past week. Um, so it's good to know that he's, right. he's all healthy and good to go. Um, I think... I think, you know, if, let's say HM were to miss, I think if you're going to start any, like, backup Miami running back in a deep-ass league, you probably want to start Ahmed and not Jeff Wilson. All right? Yeah. I I agree with that 100%. Yeah. um, Moving forward, and you can drop Jeff Jeff Wilson if you have him, by the way. Um, Moving forward, Marquise Brown, another terrible game. Only two catches for 18 yards on five targets. Both Greg Dortch and Trey McBride out-targeted him. To be fair to Hollywood, this wasn't the best matchup on the perimeter. A similar situation with Deontay Johnson. But we talked about Rondell Moore having the best matchup out of the slot. He ended up scoring a long touchdown very early. Listen, I'm not quitting on Hollywood Brown. Okay, it, it, it really sucks that he didn't come through. The Rams aren't the best matchup in the world next week either. But I, I can't imagine the target share not bouncing back in his favor. Like, it, it's just really out of character for him, right? And, and, it, and it sucks because it's like Kyler Murray comes back, his target share takes a huge hit, his production takes a huge hit, and you're just, like, assuming that this is just a, this is just the case between these two. But I, I just don't yeah. think it is. It's like, what is going on? Like, you, he was supposed to come back. Kyler Murray was supposed to come back and make Marquise Brown that wide receiver one that we were talking about. You know, I hate to lean on what we've seen between Kyler Murray and Marquise Brown from 2022 again for another whole week I know. after another down performance from Hollywood. But, like, that's what I'm going to do, and I think you're going to do it too because <laughs> there's too much of a sample size there for us to say that this is something that's going to continue the rest of the way. You know, Kyler Murray's looked like Kyler Murray. Like, we know he's the Kyler Murray we know him to be. That's good news. It's just weird that these guys, first Rondell Moore, now Greg Dortch, are suddenly out targeting Marquise Brown. That shouldn't be happening. Like, it's actually hurting Hollywood at this point. But, again, I'm not worried about him yet. You know, I wouldn't say I'm not concerned. (laughs) You know, it's a pain. Like, I'm not going to say that there isn't a part of me that's like, okay, what's going on? Why are these other guys getting more targets? Like, it should be Marquise Brown, but I'm not panicking. You know, I'm not to a point where it's like, okay, this isn't going to correct itself. There's still plenty of time for it to correct itself. I'm still starting him again next week if I have him. But I'm going to temper expectations a bit moving forward. You know, I think that's going to be key. There hasn't been anything substantial from a utiliza- utilization standpoint this season to lean on with Brown through two games with Murray. And it's hard to say he can beat the wide receiver three allegations at this point because he hasn't been anything more than that. And he had two quiet weeks in a row. I think this is one of those situations where we talk about regression to the mean. We know the type of player that Hollywood is. We know the connection that Kyler Murray and him have. That should start to pop up as we move forward. It's only his second game back. We'll see how things go. Maybe this will just take a couple couple more weeks to correct. But I'm expecting by the end of the season, at the very least, I'd say at the end of the fantasy regular season, to be at the point where Marquise Brown is back in that wide receiver two conversation. You know, it sucks because, and I, and I hate to be like this Marquise Brown apologist, right? Uh, but <laughs> That's like, what we're doing. <laughs> I know, I know. We are doing it. You're like, there's no lie. There's no lie. Like, going into week uh, 10, right? That was the first game back with Kyler Murray. He was going up against an Atlanta secondary. There were... They were they ranked twenty uh, fifth best in terms of uh, fantasy points given up to perimeter wide receivers, right? So tough matchup. And then this past week against Houston, tw- they ranked twenty seventh best uh, against perimeter wide receivers, right? Twenty eighth over the last four weeks. So not the best matchups in the world. Okay, now who is he right. going up against ne- next week? The Rams. Let's see. Uh, not the best. Okay. Uh, 28th uh, <laughs> among, you know, perimeter wide receivers, but 10th most over the last four weeks coming into this week. So it, it has yeah. it got it got a little bit better, but you know, it's one of those things where you know you just kind of hope you kind of hope that these guys could you know overcome these tough matchups with some targets, you know. Yeah, but look at the schedule after that: Pittsburgh, 
Then he has his bye. But then you got San Francisco, Chicago, Philadelphia. That's going to be fine. Really, and those really, other games that those, he had, he's had. Those are great. Yeah, except, they're really except, great. Except matches. the bye. But also, yeah, yeah. But also, <laughs> look at the stretch of games. The, you know, we mentioned these past two games because Kyler Murray came back. But look at the games even before that when he had these quiet games. Again, the Rams, Seattle, Baltimore, Cleveland. Like, really tough defenses <laughs> for some reason, all in a row for the Cardinals. And the Cardinals offense, like, maybe we're not giving them enough slack because of those matchups but at the same time it's like like you mentioned the volume usually has a tendency where wide receivers can overcome a bad matchup just by virtue of catching seven or eight passes and we haven't seen that yet with marquise brown by the way uh trey mcbride ran a route on 100 percent of kyler murray's dropbacks like you don't see that often but you know it's what you want to see for sure um tank dell yeah wow eight Ooh. catches on 10 yeah. Targets for 149 yards and a touchdown. What a run he's on right now. Three straight games of 10-plus targets. This kid is good, man. Third straight 100-yard game this year with a touchdown. He has a great matchup next week as well against Jacksonville. Nico Collins was back in this game. He had 11 targets himself. And that led the team. Uh, but one less catch than Tank. But Tank was the one with the huge plays. CJ Stroud, you know, had some bad interceptions in this game. But it didn't matter. Like He was just slinging it. He didn't care. Um, the entire offense, like this is, this is an offense you want to target, man. Like just overall in general. Yeah. Yeah. He, he said it after the game, I think perfectly. I, I don't know if you saw the quote from CJ Stroud after, cause he had those interceptions. He said, does Steph Curry stop shooting the ball? No. <laughs> like, of course he's going to keep throwing. I you love know? it. That's perfectly fine for me. That's like a perfect fantasy football comment. That's poster board material, like for fantasy managers. Yes. Like, you're just going to keep throwing the ball. Good. That's all we're asking you to do. And the thing that's really encouraging for me with Tank Dell is that he had those that high target share again with Nico Collins back. You know, these guys that are demanding targets. He did it last week with Noah Brown, now with Nico Collins. Like, he can exist with other receivers. And I think it also goes back to C.J. Stroud, too, throwing the ball a bunch of times, the way that he's elevated the offense. But we talked about this before regarding Dell and Collins. You know, I know you're a big Nico Collins guy yourself. But if you had to pick one of these two receivers to have the rest of the way, who would it be? It would be Tank like Dell. me? Yeah, it has to be tanked out. Collins has been solid. Like, don't get me wrong. And Stroud can elevate him. But I don't see the same connection on the field between Collins and Stroud as I do between Stroud and Dell. Right. You know, Dell looks like this dynamic receiver. One of the biggest things that stand out to me is a week that stood out to me these past few weeks is the week-to-week -week consistency that Dell has developed. You know, like 10-plus targets in each of the past three games. He only had 10-plus targets in one game before that this season. He's being targeted downfield. It was a 40-yard touchdown, like ridiculous lightning strike touchdowns for Tank Dell are suddenly becoming the norm. You know, Stroud is one. He's the one that's ultimately driving the production. But Dell has proven since he had that circus catch touchdown in his first preseason game, you know, that he belongs in the NFL and in fantasy lineups. He's not just this gadget flex player. He's undersized. But I don't want to compare him to Tyreek Hill. But you talk about undersized, fast receiver. It's quick. He's got twitch. Like, he has that extra gear he's super dynamic he can do more than just you know run underneath routes gadget routes he can do everything that a receiver needs to do cj stroud is dialing in on him like this is a guy that should be a mainstay in fantasy lineups the rest of the way yeah man and devin singledary too man 22 carries for 112 yards and a touchdown 87 percent of snaps 73 percent rap participation 92 percent of running back opportunities ridiculous rb1 high rb1 type of usage here the big question is what happens when Damian Pierce is back, right? Uh, so Pierce got a limited yeah. practice in on Friday. It's possible he's back next week. But with the way Singletary is playing, like, I can see them sticking with him a little bit. Like, maybe not the type of role he's been seeing without Pierce, obviously, but Pierce hasn't had any games like this this year, right? Like, these last two weeks yeah. for Singletary, like, he, the Texans have an effective running game now. Like, why would they change things up that dramatically like if i were them i might just let singletary do his thing for a little bit longer just to see if it kind of phases out and if it does then maybe put in pierce a little bit you know what i'm saying but maybe singletary's onto something here i think that could be the case and going to what you said like why would you take the guy out that's on fire like he's been doing these past two weeks devin singletary why would you take the guy out that's on fire and replace him with somebody that's just now defrosting Right. <laughs> like, that's what's <laughs> happening with Damian Pierce. You know, he's defrosting. Like, we, we, for weeks, he wasn't practicing. He gets his first practice in, limited practice at that on Friday. They rule him out immediately afterwards. Like, there's no momentum at all with Damian Pierce. They have all this momentum with Singletary. Don't mess it up. You know, what? whatever Singletary's doing, whatever they're doing with Singletary in this offense with C.J. Stroud is working. 
And this is something that we've alluded to plenty of times on the podcast since Pierce has been out. Singletary had that explosion last week. It looks like this is relatively sustainable production for Singletary while Pierce is out. But like you mentioned, Pierce could be back this next week. One of the biggest things that stands out to me, though, the Texans have run a ton, and I say a ton, of plays the past two weeks. Like, where are they getting the play volume? They have two players earn 10 targets this week, 10-plus targets at that, and have a running back log 25 opportunities. Like, Mm -hmm. Houston's games have been competitive, and that's always a good thing for fantasy football, but the sheer number of plays they've been running recently, you know, it's made them one of the hottest fantasy offenses in the league, and that's one of the stats that kind of flies under the radar. If your offense is running a bunch of plays, you're going to have a lot of players that can get it done. Regardless of game script, these have been competitive games, but both the run game and the passing game have been firing on all cylinders. CJ Stroud's throwing for 300 yards apiece. Like, there's something to be said for the number of plays they're running in each game. Yeah, man. Um, it's it's interesting because the like every single game that goes by, you're just like, all right, well, this offense can be one of those offenses that just take you through the fantasy playoffs and into a fantasy championship. You know, if you have pieces yeah. on this offense, you know. So we'll see what they do in this backfield, you know. And by the way, I just want to say that uh, our analogies have been on fire so far in this show. Uh, Calvin <laughs> yes. really not the frosting like Damian Pierce. <laughs> Calvin really ended we're, up we're, coming we're through fire. in this game. Uh, six catches for ten targets for eighty-three yards and two touchdowns. Yep, I'm talking about Calvin really here. Okay, and we talked about it. We talked about it on the wide <laughs> receiver episode. Okay, I mentioned and I talked about I talked about it last Sunday too. You know, in, on this show. Don't get frustrated with Ridley, okay? And, and well, no, no, don't, uh, I'll say this. You can get frustrated, but don't make that frustration be the reason why you throw him on your bench, okay? He had the better matchup than Christian Kirk, and, and I trusted Kirk more, so I was playing Kirk over Ridley, no doubt about it, but it doesn't mean that Ridley needs to go on the bench. How many teams did you really have Kirk over Ridley anyway? Like, or did you have both these guys on, on the same roster? You didn't, okay? So Ridley, right. he did have the better matchup. He ended up coming through. Okay, now, with that being said, I don't love him next week against Houston. Okay, uh, but, uh, you know, it's one of those yeah. things where it's like you bench him in a good matchup, and then he scores two touchdowns and 100 yards, and now you want to start him next week, but he has a bad matchup, and then he's going to not perform, and then you're going to get frustrated again, and then you're going to bench him in the good matchup. It's like, no, 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 hold on. Don't base your start sits on what the guy did the week before. Okay, especially if they're capable. The weeks, plural. Yeah, sure, <laughs> but but it, it wasn't yeah. it, with him. Was it weeks? Like, was it even? I don't even know. Like, let's, let's, I'm gonna take a quick, quick cursory. As a Calvin Ridley manager, I, I hear I you. Say, I hear you. It was it's, a pretty it's rough ride. But look, <laughs> the look, past four weeks, he said four. I, I hear you, but check this out. Like the targets have been there. Okay, against Pittsburgh. Yeah. So San Francisco last week, shit show, right? They were terrible. They had to buy against Pittsburgh, 6 for 83, 10 targets. The week before, shit show. Tough matchup against New Orleans, though. Against Indy, 4 for 30, terrible. But he still had the 8 targets, high target share. And then a Buffalo, 7 for 122. So it's like the games are going to be there, you know, and you got to kind of have to pick your spots, you know. And, and San Francisco last week was one of those spots that, you know, you kind of liked. I liked personally. Um, but the entire offense right. just got shut down, and Trevor Lawrence just immediately got shut down. Now, you know, Trevor Lawrence finally had a great fantasy day, right? It took two rushing touchdowns. It's only his third two-passing touchdown game. I, I personally wouldn't expect this to continue for Lawrence, personally, <laughs> right? If you can take advantage no. of this big game, if your trade deadline's not up and someone needs a quarterback, maybe the Superflex League, uh, maybe you want to take advantage. Do it. <laughs> just do it. Yeah. No, I'm so, I'm I'm just going to put this out there. Like I'm complaining about Calvin Ridley, but I've had the Calvin Ridley philosophy that you're, you know, advocating for. It's just like leave him in your lineup. Just keep doing it. Cuz the target share has been there. But you don't in his situation, you don't want to get caught playing the Gabe Davis game yes. with Calvin Ridley or any receiver, any receiver of this caliber, you know, on a good offense that's underperforming. You know the Gabe Davis game cuz as soon as you take him out, He's going to have a big game. You're going to put him in. He's going to get no targets. That kind of thing. You don't want to play that game. That's kind of what it's been with Calvin Ridley. That's the way I'm looking at it. He has this big game. I'm not expecting this to keep happening because that's just been the way we've seen the season go. He's only over 20 fantasy points in three games this season. The rest of them, the target share has been there on and off. You're not going to be able to predict what's going to happen moving forward with Calvin Ridley. But we see that the upside's there, and you can you can take advantage of that. I think for that reason, he's best suited as like a flex or a wide receiver three. <laughs> I don't I don't think I'm going to rank him 
as anything higher than a low wide receiver two yeah. moving forward. You know, I think that's where I'm kind of at with him right now. Tennessee was a solid matchup until we see some sustainable connection between Lawrence and Ridley. Like this is one game is great. It looked good. But until we see this on like a more weekly basis, don't get giddy now about Ridley in your lineup. Like if you were depending on Ridley, you were putting him in your lineup every single week. It finally pays off. Don't get giddy now and be like, okay, this is going to be the norm. This is going to happen all the time. Like just keep playing him, but don't expect that upside. You're going to get yourself frustrated when he doesn't meet those expectations. And that's like you said, going to play into you putting him on your bench in frustration and you miss out on one of these big games it's, it's a sad it's a sad reality with Ridley because we're expecting a lot more but he's been a disappearing act in all but three games this season so you have to kind of just take your lumps with him leave him in your lineup that's right that's right okay uh Travis Etienne had some interesting usage uh over the last two games uh and it, a lot of it had to do with blowouts right and, and the Jaguars being on both sides of it so 63% of snaps in week 10, 66% of snaps this week, 81% of snaps for the season before week 10, okay? But a lot closer games for them in those games. 60% of the rushing attempts in week 10. Uh, Dearness Johnson, you know, owned the field for 60% of third quarter snaps in this one, which was kind of interesting because the game was only 13-0 at halftime, but then Johnson was the one to open the third quarter. I think it was... I, I think it was one of those situations where, and we kind of seen this a little bit this year, where, and we see that with the Ravens, right? When they're up and they realize at halftime that, hey, we're going to be running the ball a lot in the second half, most likely. So let's start getting our running back, yeah. other running backs involved so we don't overwork our main running back. And I think that's what happened in this game. So and I think it was one of those situations, right? They wanted the ball to be spread around a little bit in the second half, and, and they made the right call because they ended up blowing out, you know, their opponent here. So, you know, and, and I, I yeah. will say, so, I, so I'm not necessarily concerned here for him, okay? If you look at the snaps right. on paper, though, you're like, uh, like, this doesn't seem great. You're, you're, you're thinking of a Kenneth Walker type of situation, right? But even in that situation, yeah. you shouldn't yeah. have been concerned because in week 10, it bounced back, Right. This is obviously not talking about, you know, that's besides the fact that he suffered an injury in this game. But one thing to note, uh, that Tank Bigsby doesn't seem to be the clear handcuff that he was uh, before these last two games. Like, I think I'd rather roster Dearness Johnson at this point because he has been the one getting more of the work as the RB2 than Bigsby. Um, so I think if you're rostering yeah. Bigsby as, like, ETN's handcuff, like, I think it's not worth it anymore. Um, you might not even want to roster Dearness Johnson because, like, if ETM were to get hurt, we could see a split there, right? And then on the goal line, it could be Bigsby because he did get he did have a big fourth and one conversion in this game. Um, so it, it's one of those things where you know, and we've seen Dearness Johnson, you know, have good games before, right, on the Browns. So this yeah. is not really that a, one time, yeah, with the Browns. No, no, not <laughs> just one time, but he, you know, he had a significant role last year in that backfield. So. It's one of those things where, like, I'm not yeah. super surprised that, you know, he's kind of earned his way to, like, uh, that RB2 role for the Jaguars. Oh, yeah. Uh, when I say one time with uh, the Browns, it was just hyperbole. Uh, I was just trying to, like, just explain that, you know, this is somebody they have to prioritize right now. With Travis Etienne, I think the distance between – we were talking about Tank Bigsby potentially being somebody that takes snaps from Travis Etienne. That gap is obviously really wide. Yes. And it's just between Tank Bigsby right now and um, Dearness Johnson for that handcuff role. And until Travis Etienne gets hurt, like, is it really worth having them on your roster? Like, I, I think if no. they were both on the waiver wire right now, I don't think it would be a crime. You know what I'm saying? Like, I, I think I, I think get away they with should them. be on both on the waiver wire. Like, for me personally, that's what I'm saying. Yeah, I only want to roster a handcuff when they're the clear guy. Like, when I know that one of them is getting like 70 percent of the work. You know what I'm saying? Like, yeah. it's worth grabbing Zach, like handcuffing Zach Charbonnet because you know that he's gonna get majority of the the rushing and the receiving it's it's and tajay spears he has thing. a little standalone value himself too sure you know when you talk about yeah, you talk about their handcuffs you talk about them having standalone value then also are they going to get all the work yeah so i i know what you're saying but my point is that both of these guys at this point right now with travis Etienne, as long as he's healthy like they're not going to have any value yeah because they're just going to be eating away at each other they're just going to be fighting each other and they're just going to be looking up at travis Etienne the whole time yeah 100 percent. hey tony Pollard scored a touchdown Let's go. Sound the alarm. Sound the alarm. <laughs> Finally. 16 total touches. Got it done. Rico Dowdle got a lot of work, too, with this being a blowout for Dallas in the fourth quarter. A lot of blowouts for Dallas, man. 
A lot of blowouts for Dallas. It caused yep. Pollard, you know, to barely play in the fourth quarter. What's new? Like, uh, uh, like, is there <laughs> like? Okay, it's funny, man. Like, I'm thinking about a regression here for Tony Pollard for for the for the Cowboys' offense in terms of like, how many blowouts can they have in one year? Like, it, it it's like I, I don't know. At, at some point, it's gonna have to be some. There have there's gonna be have to be some close games here. Maybe those close games can yeah. come during the fantasy playoffs. And Tony Pollard can get like his best workloads during the fantasy playoffs. Like, that's it, that's what you have to hope for if you ha- if you have Tony Pollard. Yeah, but <laughs> I'll tell you what. Yes, he scored a touchdown, but no, this doesn't change the fact that he's still a bust this season. And honestly, I don't think it's going to get a whole lot better because we've seen Dallas's offense play very well in games where they have good matchups in the passing game, namely for the receivers with Ceedee Lamb and also Dak. Look at this next game. They're playing Washington. Washington's in the top three for fantasy points allowed to wide receivers. What kind of game do you think that's going to be? It's not going to be a running game. Like, Tony Pollard hasn't been doing enough. And then you look, the games get as the games get more competitive, they go Seattle, Philly, Buffalo, Miami, Detroit. After that game against Washington, like, do any of those games, sure, they might be, you know, regular neutral game scripts, but that's not going to be calling for Tony Pollard, Tony Pollard, Tony Pollard. I don't think there's going to be as many blowouts like you mentioned, did you just say his but name that's also t- going to be. Just, did you just say his name three times? Oh, what, what do you think? I'm trying to summon him? I think or so. Something like that? I think so. <laughs> nah, I know. I just got all this new cowboy stuff behind me. I know, maybe I am doing something like that. You know, I said Are you up, a Cowboys fan? But I would never have guessed. Oh, really? No. <laughs> so that was one of my best kept secrets here on the podcast. Guys, I'm a Cowboys fan. <laughs> Believe it or not. But with, with Tony Pollard, I, I just don't see a situation where he gets, you know, he had two games early in the season where he had 20 plus touches in a ground game it looks like this 12 to 15 touch threshold is where we're going to be sitting right. the rest of the way because the passing game is too good to not rely on if, it, if it's a neutral game script dallas has been leaning more on the pass since the bye week in neutral game scripts and actually positive game scripts they were doing a lot last week against the giants they were throwing the ball on first down into the fourth quarter so that, that it's a really weird thing to predict when you have game scripts where they're just blowouts 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 i think this next game might be a blowout against washington as long as the offense stays how it's supposed to be. But as the games get more competitive, I just don't think that's going to necessarily mean an increase in touches for Tony Pollard either. So I'm tempering expectations still. Yes, he scored a touchdown, great. But I'm not buying that this is going to be a normal thing moving forward. This game is in Dallas on Thanksgiving. It's a wrap for the Commanders. Uh, <laughs> do you think, Ron Rivera, do you think Ron Rivera DeVito. is Ron Rivera <laughs> going to be fired before Thanksgiving? Yes or no? They're going to fire him on Thanksgiving. <laughs> Jeez <laughs> They're Louise. going to send him home. Jeez, <laughs> Can Louise. you imagine that? That would be oh so messed God. up, man. Uh, why, I mean, it's called Black Friday for a reason. Maybe they just do it then. Yeah. You know. Yeah, I don't know. Dude, uh, it's, it's something. Chuba Hubbard and Miles Sanders split work down the middle all the way. It looks like Sanders is working himself back into the rotation. 50-50 in snaps, touches, all that. So it makes both of them less startable, especially with this offense being shit. Uh, Adam Thielen <laughs> did end up yeah. coming through. We talked about it on Friday to trust him with Frank Wright calling the plays again. He didn't score, but he did come through in PPR leagues, 8 for 74 uh, on 11 targets. Um, Jameer Gibbs ended up outsnapping David Montgomery, again, 58% to 40%. David Montgomery's role has like regressed a bit more to that the traditional Jamal Williams role we saw last year, except Montgomery is just better and a more efficient runner. Gibbs now has the role we yeah. wanted all along. Now we have a two-game sample si- size now out of the bye. Both games pretty similar. You know, about 58% of snaps to you know for Gibbs, 48% of snaps for Montgomery in both weeks 10 and 11. 50% of opportunities for each of them this week, but the big difference is that Gibbs is getting most of that work in the receiving game. He caught all six of his targets in this one 59 yards. And guess what? More usage for Gibbs inside the five-yard line, like another touchdown scored this week, right? So yeah. it's not primarily David Montgomery there anymore. However, he did get his own goal line carry later in the game. So Gibbs is locked in at this point. Low-end RB1 moving forward. He's been scoring like a high-end RB1. Okay, his role is more like a low-end RB1. But hey, just remember where we were. Where, just remember where we were a few weeks ago, right? The world was falling. On Jameer Gibbs. And now my man is looking like a league winner. Okay. Uh, Montgomery's role right now is like a touchdown dependent, like low end RB2, high end RB3 at best. But he's going to score touchdowns in games more often than not. So it's like he's going to perform 
more he was gonna he's gonna perform better than what his role would indicate in normal situations uh, and like it's hard to just it's hard to not have him in your lineup right it's kind of like that gus edwards situation you just don't want to miss out yeah i'm happy with dave montgomery if he's in my lineup as an rb2 you know i'm not worried about that if that's the case because he's super efficient like you mentioned he's on an offense that's gonna be scoring a lot of touchdowns it was looking dicey for I'd say 55 of the 60 minutes <laughs> for Dave Montgomery this week. You know, obviously late in the game, he had that late touchdown to put them up. It was just a weird game for the Lions overall, but everybody en- ended up coming through who was supposed to come through. But with Jameer Gibbs, they finally, and it's great. Like we thought, okay, Dave Montgomery's coming back. You know, maybe that was the end of Jameer Gibbs as we know it. But since Dave Montgomery came back, they're using him, like you mentioned, in the exact role that we wanted for him. Like exact, to a T. Like, oh, he's going to get the receiving work. He's going to be efficient in the run game, but if he could get that goal line roll every just once in a while, get a goal line carry here or there, like it's just going to unlock this RB1 upside for him, and that's what, we, what we've seen. The past not only two, two weeks, but four weeks, he had that role. He was the lead back without Dave Montgomery. We know who Jameer Gibbs is. This is the usage we were screaming for with DeAndre Swift when, when DeAndre Swift was in Detroit. Like Now they're finally doing it with Jameer Gibbs, and it's working for them fantastically. The good news is that they've been winning games. You know, It's not like it's been costing them games using – uh, Jameer Gibbs anymore than they've been using him. You know, what a surprise. But this is exactly what we're looking for. Savor it. I think that still, it's easy to look back at the game log these past four weeks and be like, yeah, this is an RB1. Like, definitely low-end RB1. I think high-end RB2 is safe at this point, just the way, the virtue, by virtue of the way that he's producing, like you mentioned in the receiving game, he's going to have a really solid floor. But when he's scoring touchdowns on top of that receiving floor, he's going to finish inside the top 10 more often than not. And that's exactly what we wanted for Jameer Gibbs. It took a couple weeks, and things were looking bad at the beginning, but you can trust him now. Move forward. Justin Fields came back. He did Justin Fields things. 100 yards rushing on 18 carries. That's not Khalil Herbert's numbers. Those are Justin Fields' numbers. And the fact <laughs> that he had as many design runs as he did, mwah, that's what we want to see. <laughs> You know what I'm saying? And guess what? DJ yeah. Moore had a great game once again. Seven catches for 96 yards and a 39-yard touchdown. You know, that's what you want to see. Okay, so DJ Moore is back. We talked about the splits coming into this game with Fields and without. He's back as a high-end wide receiver, two for me, in a solid matchup next week in Minnesota. I had him as a high-end wide receiver, two coming into this week in my rankings. You know, it does suck that he has the bye in week 14, but he does get Detroit again at home after the bye. So, I'm looking at DJ Moore, rest of the season. It's looking pretty good because you're looking at the splits between him and Justin, you know, with Justin Fields now. It is a pretty solid sample size of some really good games. Yeah, I'll give it to you. I was a little bit lower on DJ Moore. Looks like I was wrong. So I'll concede that. DJ Moore looks good. I thought it would take a week. Justin Fields came back and looked like Justin Fields. Good for them. But when you talk about DJ Moore with that great game, it's like, that's exactly what we've been waiting for. It's really nice to see, especially if you've had DJ, especially if you've had DJ Moore in your lineup. The past few weeks, you've been dealing with Tyson Bajan, a quarterback. It's It just feels weird because it's like such an obvious correlation. You know, rarely do we see it where it's just like the splits. That's how it works. But that's how it's been with DJ Moore this season. So he is back. I'll give you that. He's looking really good. Justin Fields, you know, he comes back. He has that rushing upside again. Great to see. Like the design runs, like you mentioned. The chef's kiss. It's like a Tommy DeVito. Like Tommy DeVito, you can't see it if you're just listening on Spotify. But you can see on YouTube if you're watching. You know, I have my hand right here, and it's that Tommy DeVito, the Italian, like, mm, you know, fantastic. What they do when they finish making a pizza, you know what I'm saying? Like, that's what they just, the coaching staff for the Bears just did with Justin Fields. It, it was exactly what we wanted to see from him. Really solid game coming back. Are you trusting them both as top 15 options, you know, moving forward the rest of the season? Would you put them both in that bucket at their respective positions, do you think? Well, I had Justin Fields as my, what, QB9 on the week. So, yeah, he was already right. he was already there. He was already top 10 Q- QB for me. He's going to be top 7 or 8 probably right. moving forward. And then G.J. Moore was already high in wide receiver 2. He's going to stay around there as well. So, yeah, top 15-ish sounds good. Um, now, every single team is playing in week 12. So, Thanksgiving weekend, every team is playing. No team is on by. So, things kind of change a little bit when, like, we've been used to, like, four teams on by. So, we'll see where they end up landing. Um, but yeah, yeah, pretty much, right? Like in terms of usage, that's kind of how I see them. Um, yeah. Yeah. So, uh, by the way, Deontay Foreman hurt his ankle in this game. This was a three-man committee before he got hurt. But if Foreman is out next week, Herbert will be a solid RB2 play. 
with Roshan Johnson complimenting him on passing downs. Uh, by the way, the game is on Monday night next week. Saquon Barkley, huge performance, 14 carries for 83 yards, four catches for 57 yards and two touchdowns. This dude is overcoming a lot, but at the same time, even Tommy DeVito threw for 246 yards and three touchdowns against this, against this Washington defense. Absolutely terrible. Like we were talking about before, like Ron Rivera, he needs to be fired after this <laughs> game, okay? Like, by the way, like, like I'm, here, I'm curious to hear your opinion on this. Like, this might be a good opportunity to sell Saquon. Like if you're still able to in your league, the schedule is not good the rest of the the rest of the way. Uh, he also has the buy in week 13, so right now it, it could be a good time to get out. If you can't move him, like this game is definitely encouraging because he's efficient. You know he's involved in the receiving game. Tom DeVito at least is looking for him. He had that like really nice receiving touchdown in the end zone. Like yep. when Tommy DeVito found him in the corner there, so. You know, very encouraging for sure, but this is also a really bad defense. This can be a little bit of a mirage moving forward. Yeah, a, a little bit of a mirage. <laughs> this is like a super squishy defense. If, if Dallas doesn't hang 60 on him on Thursday, like I'm, uh, I think I'm going to riot or something like that. Cause Tommy, <laughs> if Tommy DeVito is throwing for three touchdowns against you, 246 yards, no picks, I might add. This was like a perfect day for Tommy DeVito. Like, there's something going on here. You can definitely sell off of this. Saquon Barkley had his biggest game. I think this is his biggest game of the season in terms of points. Yeah. Right? Yeah. 30 points. But it is his biggest game in terms of points. This is definitely a sell window because I don't think he's going to be scoring a whole lot of touchdowns. The squishiness of the commander's defense is masking how bad this Giants offense is. And like you mentioned, the schedule down the stretch is truly horrific. It's not a schedule that you can overcome with Tommy DeVito, a quarterback. I don't want to keep crapping on Tommy DeVito, but I'm just going to say, Enjoy it while it lasted. This isn't going to happen again, I don't think, against an NFL defense. The, the commander's defense, remember, they sold their defense pretty much at the trade deadline. They got rid of Chase Young. They got rid of Montez Sweat. Like, there's not a whole lot left for this uh, commander's defense. So, sell Saquon Barkley. I'm with you on this one. That one's not particularly difficult for me, especially if your trade deadline's coming up. You move off of him <laughs> because we, we, he we has a lot more it. value this week yeah. yeah we talked about it in the running backs episode with steve from fantasy guys he mentioned it as well like if saquon it happens to have a good game this week it might be a good opportunity to sell so it looks like that's playing. so he foresaw that one yeah, yeah it looks like that, that, that's playing out Pretty yeah sharp. um without antonio <laughs> gibson uh brian robinson ended up playing on 78 percent of snaps had 25 opportunities he came through big time for fantasy uh if gibson were to miss any more time you should feel confident having him in your lineup moving forward you know, even in a tough matchup next week. But, but damn, you know, seven catches on nine targets. Like, I see you, B-Rob. Like, this is the real B-Rob right here. This is the real B-Rob right here. He's. This <laughs> is the workload that we were expecting from B-Rob, as in the one in Atlanta. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but we, I, I, I feel stupid now because last week I was like, oh, when is when is Brian <laughs> Robinson going to get more than six targets in a game and catch most of us? Like, and he turns around and does this against the Giants. Like, he's suddenly like decent and i know we called him out for being a mirage you know everybody everybody was calling him the rb6 on the year it's like oh that's total points not average well to, yeah, well now he's past three fa- weeks well, he's been pretty good yeah but to be fair gibson was out and and you know we did expect this i talked about it yesterday on my instagram story like with gibson out like you gotta upgrade robinson right like it is what it is so yeah. he got the opportunity it probably wouldn't have been the case if gibson was was active in this one it, it's weird because like he kind of and I don't want to go too far with this, but he kind of looked pretty all right, yeah. pretty good, you know, on the work that he got. So I don't want to say, has he beat the just a guy allegations? No, I don't know. <laughs> I, I think he's trending towards <laughs> getting closer to beating them, but I don't know if that's going to continue, you know, and that's a narrative. I like to, I, I've been pushing this the whole time that we've been, that I've been on this podcast. Like you started a while ago and I've taken it to the next <laughs> level. I don't want to. I don't want to lose this narrative. You know what I'm saying. I hear that. So we'll see what happens. Hopefully, my Cowboys can keep my narrative alive this next week. All right, a couple things to close out the podcast real quick, guys. Cooper Cup ended up hurting his ankle. It seems like a low ankle sprain, so hopefully he won't have to miss any time. He wasn't getting anything done before that. Neither was Puka, but Puka started to come on big time to help lead the Rams come back. Had a very solid fantasy day with that touchdown as well. Um, and you know, the other side of the ball, you know, Royce at the same on the same side of the ball actually. Royce Freeman ended up leading the Rams running game. Daryl Henderson averaged zero point two yards per carry in this one. It doesn't matter anymore though, because Kyron Williams will be back next week. 
We're expecting him to return to his normal RB1 role that he had before he got hurt. Sean McVay did say before the bye that he expects Williams to be back when he is first eligible, which is next week. Okay. That's yes. going to close it out you for this episode. Stop. Yeah. Go ahead, Brian. Go, go ahead, Zach. Sorry, I was just going to say, you can stop making decisions between Daryl Hunters and Royce yes. Freeman. We know it's, it's been hell it's, these past couple weeks. It's but over. It's, it's over. It's it, over. Kyron Williams will be back. It's over. <laughs> we appreciate you guys. Uh, we'll be back for the waiver wire episode. Uh, and – on Wednesday, we're going to be cutting this week short, okay? Wednesday, we're going to be going over all of the positions for for every matchup, okay? So, we'll see you then. Take it easy, guys. Bye-bye.